Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question asks if I can analyze the mental health and personality factors that may be at work in the case of Tanya Harding. Another question here is, can I review the movie, I, Tanya? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I'll put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. So here I'll be looking at the background of Tanya Harding. I'll talk about the mental health and personality factors, and I'll analyze the crime for which she is famous. Tanya Harding was born in Portland, Oregon on November 12, 1970. Her father's name is Albert Harding, and her mother's name is Lavana Golden. At age three, she would begin ice skating. When she was older, she engaged in a number of other activities like fixing cars, drag racing, and hunting. Harding would later claim that Lavana had mistreated her, both physically and emotionally. She also claimed that she was the victim of an assault of a sexual nature perpetrated by her half-brother. In September 1986, Harding began a relationship with a 17-year-old named Jeff Galuli. Albert and Lavana would divorce in 1987 when Harding was in high school. Harding would drop out of high school and instead earn a GED. In 1988, Harding and Galuli moved in together. They would marry in 1990. Harding was quite successful in competitive figure skating. She competed in the U.S. Figure Skating Championships from 1986 through 1994, placing first in 1991. On January 6, 1994, just before the U.S. Figure Skating Championships at Kobo Arena in Detroit, Michigan, a figure skater named Nancy Kerrigan was attacked after a practice session by a man named Shane Stant. Immediately after the attack, Stant escaped by breaking a glass door and got into a car driven by Derek Smith. Stant had struck Kerrigan in the right leg just above her knee with a 21-inch telescopic baton, causing severe bruising and forcing her to miss the championships. Nancy Kerrigan was a competitor of Tanya Harding, arguably one of Harding's most worthy rivals, and Kerrigan's absence increased Harding's chances in both the figure skating championships and the upcoming Winter Olympics. Two days later, Tanya Harding would win the U.S. title. As it turns out, the attack was part of a conspiracy involving several people. Jeff Galuli was now Tanya Harding's ex-husband. They were divorced in 1993. However, at the time of the attack, the two were together romantically. Now, Galuli had a friend named Sean Eckhart, who also became Harding's bodyguard. Galuli gave Eckhart $6,500 that Eckhart, in turn, gave to Derek Smith, the getaway driver. Shane Stant, the assailant, was Smith's nephew. January 18, 1994, now represented by counsel, Harding was questioned by the FBI. All four men involved in the attack would eventually be arrested and plead guilty. Stant and Smith pleaded guilty to conspiracy to commit second-degree assault, and Eckhart and Galuli pleaded guilty to racketeering. Tanya Harding would plead guilty to conspiracy to hinder prosecution, a felony, on March 16, 1995. Her admissions were restricted to having knowledge of the attack after it happened, participating in the development of a cover story for Eckhart and Galuli, and lying to the FBI. Harding has repeatedly denied knowing about the attack beforehand. The plea agreement allowed her to avoid going to prison. Later that same year, the United States Figure Skating Association concluded Harding did have prior knowledge of the attack and was involved in the attack. This was based on a preponderance of the evidence, which is much different than the reasonable doubt standard. It's based on what's more likely in a scenario. So was there a 51% chance that she was guilty? Harding was stripped of the 1994 U.S. Championship title and banned for life from the association's events. Harding married again in 1995, only to divorce in 1996. After the scandal, Harding briefly got into boxing. She appeared in a few different television shows. And after that, she worked a variety of jobs. A painter, a sales clerk at Sears, a welder, and a deck builder. In February of 2000, Harding repeatedly punched her boyfriend in the face and threw a hubcap at his head. She would go to jail for three days. 
In June of 2010, she married a 42-year-old man named Joseph Price. The couple had a son in February 2011. Tanya Harding changed her name to Tanya Price. Now, as we look at the movie, I, Tanya, we see this movie was released in 2017, and it starred Margot Robbie as Tanya Harding. There are events in the movie that have not necessarily been supported by evidence, and there are events that appear to be true. One of the most controversial elements of the movie, and arguably of reality, would be the relationship between Tanya and her mother, Lavana. Some of Lavana's behaviors showcased in the movie were corroborated by independent witnesses. For example, Lavana being so demanding, Lavana making Harding wear her skating outfit for class pictures so those pictures could be used in competition, and Lavana striking Harding with a hairbrush. Other elements in the context of that relationship are unverified, like the incident with the knife. That incident where Lavana allegedly threw a knife at Tanya Harding and cut her arm. Many other parts of the movie were unverified as well, or in some cases, made up. I wanted to cover a few elements in the movie that were accurately depicted that were kind of surprising. Shane Stant really did use his head to break through the glass door after attacking Kerrigan. This is an interesting escape plan that really tells us everything we need to know about the level of sophistication in this criminal enterprise. Sean Eckhart did claim to be a secret agent, and he did brag about orchestrating the attack to several people. Now moving to the mental health and personality factors. After Harding was sentenced, she was asked if she had any mental instability or emotional problems. Her answer was, I don't know. Now Harding claims that Lavana drank excessively, but Lavana denies that claim. So as far as mental health factors, we really don't see any that have been verified. Looking at the potential personality profile for Harding, we see someone who has mid-range openness to experience. We see mid-range conscientiousness. Clearly, Tanya Harding was a hard worker, but sometimes she did seem a bit impulsive. She was a risk taker, which isn't always bad. For example, she was the first American female figure skater to land a triple axel in competition. Many other skaters could perform the triple axel, but they were afraid to tempt it in competition. She did this at age 20, so that was really remarkable. Harding was extroverted, especially in the area of assertiveness and sensation-seeking. Her level of agreeableness was probably lower than average. She embraced competition over cooperation, and she was not always modest. And for the last trait, neuroticism, we see a mid-range level. She was cool under pressure, but she also had a tendency to get angry. For my analysis of the dynamics of the crime, I'm going to assume that Harding did have prior knowledge of the attack, or at least some wrongdoing against Kerrigan, and that her relationship with her mother was similar to how it was characterized in the movie. So here's what could have happened. Growing up, Harding was interested in a lot of activities typically associated with masculinity. She used coarse language. She's been described as a tomboy. She was athletically talented and interested in figure skating. She thought that figure skating was beautiful and a lot of fun. Her mother saw the athletic talent and sacrificed so her daughter could receive the coaching she needed to succeed. In the world of figure skating, Harding was not considered to exemplify the version of femininity that they approved of, so she struggled to fit in. Additionally, she didn't have a lot of money to afford skating outfits that would make her seem more on par with her competitors. Harding knew that she was technically talented, and she was frustrated that she wasn't more successful. She wasn't really well-rounded in the eyes of the judges. Harding had this dysfunctional relationship with Galuli, who in turn had other dysfunctional relationships like with Eckhart. Harding was driven to win internally, but also perhaps driven by her mother's cold and demanding behavior. It's not just that Harding would like to win, she really needed to win. It was her life. Her sense of purpose was wrapped up entirely in her skating performance, the opinions of her mother, and of course the opinions of the judges. In a desperate attempt to increase her chances of winning, she perhaps endorses the idea of doing something negative toward Kerrigan. She may have expressed this explicitly or implicitly. Maybe she said something like, it would be nice if something happened to Kerrigan, but never gave specifics, like trying to set up plausible deniability. 
Galuli picks up on these messages, and they are relayed to Eckhart. They expand again, so we see this exponential growth. Now the plan moves to causing physical harm to Nancy Kerrigan. Too many impulsive people in the mix leads to disaster. The crime is committed, and now everybody must pay for their role in that crime. So that leads to the question, did Tanya Harding know about the attack in advance? I've thought about this quite a bit. This is really a tough case. Let's look at the factors both for and against the idea that she knew in advance. The strongest indication that she knew in advance was that she pled guilty to a felony, conspiracy to hinder prosecution. Now, as I mentioned, that's not the same thing as second degree assault. But here's why I think this supports the idea that she did know about the attack in advance. Usually in a plea agreement, somebody pleads guilty to a lesser version of what they actually did or what they're charged with. That's the whole idea behind a plea deal. The government gives up something and the citizen gives up something. It's a compromise based on the strength of the government's case and the government's willingness to spend money to try the case. In the case of Harding, why would she plead guilty to exactly what she did? How is this a good plea agreement? She was represented by counsel, so we would think that the plea agreement would be somewhat beneficial to Harding. This really sounds like an awful deal. For example, if somebody's charged with first-degree burglary, they might plead guilty to second-degree burglary or misdemeanor theft. They would not normally plead guilty to the most serious charge. So that makes me wonder, what was the most serious crime with which she could have been charged? Now, outside of the plea agreement, there was also this handwritten note by Harding that seemed to show Nancy Kerrigan's skating schedule. It seems unusual that Harding would need that. Also, Galuli said that Harding knew in advance, although, as one could imagine, Galuli is not the most trustworthy source of information. So what about the evidence against Harding knowing in advance? Tanya Harding has denied that she knew anything about the attack. She has maintained the story even though I don't believe she can be prosecuted at this point. I think the plea agreement precluded that, and likely the statute of limitations would be up anyway. Why not just own the bad behavior and try to move forward? Many people believe she did it anyway, so if she really did do it, one would think she would just come clean. The four men involved in the attack were capable of doing this without Harding. To varying degrees, they seemed impulsive and irresponsible. For example, we know that Shane Stant had a criminal record. I think it's believable that at some point in the chain of bad decisions, somebody went too far without Harding approving of it or knowing about it. So going back to that question, did she know in advance? I think when weighing all the factors, it seems likely that she did. So what about the question, was justice served? The attack on Kerrigan was terrible and could have been much worse. It was irresponsible, dangerous, and foolish. At the same time, Harding only admitted to helping the conspirators get away with it after the fact. She was never convicted in the planning of the attack. Her sentence did not involve prison, but she was given three years probation, 500 hours community service, and a number of financial penalties. Considering her age, she was just 23 at the time, and the stress that she was under, this seems like a fair sentence, in my opinion. But what about being banned for life from skating? Harding's whole life was skating. Even though the movie made it appear as though the court banned her from skating for life, the court order forced her to surrender her membership in the United States Figure Skating Association. It's not clear if that was permanent. Like when her probation was done, perhaps she would have been allowed to reapply. But it wouldn't matter. Functionally, that ended her skating career. On top of that, the association eventually banned her for life, as I mentioned. I think this penalty was heavy-handed, and here's why. A sentence really needs to be for the crime that somebody's convicted of, not for what a person was charged with or is believed to have committed. We see a number of other athletes who did much worse and were allowed to return to their sports. For example, Mike Tyson. I think that Harding should have been suspended for two years, but then allowed to live her life. Nancy Kerrigan accepted Harding's apology just as it was, which is good enough for me. So what are the lessons learned in this case? Some have called the male conspirators in this case 
clowns. They did seem to have special talents. Those four men made the Three Stooges look like Ocean's Eleven. The lesson here, just because you are surrounded by clowns doesn't mean you should start a circus. Harding should have distanced herself from everybody who had any type of criminal predisposition. Other lessons in this case, success is often a team effort. Tanya did not appear to have a good team. I think some people that she had were helpful, like her coaches, but other people like Jeff Galuli really hurt Tanya Harding. The last lesson, often people pay for their behavior in their teens and 20s for the rest of their lives, right? It's a period of impulsivity. So these decisions are made and the individuals do not understand the consequences. They don't understand how it resets the trajectory of their lives negatively and how it is often irreversible. Those are my thoughts on Tanya Harding. Please put any opinions or thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be interesting. Thanks for watching.